Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Today's message is presented by Dr. Kenny Hodges. Kenny holds a Master of Divinity from Dallas Theological Seminary and a Doctor of Ministries from Prairie School of Theology. Kenny has titled today's message, Suffering Today in View of Tomorrow. Just as the sun shines on the just and the unjust, so too everyone suffers. Kenny shows us that followers of Jesus Christ are able to find comfort and courage amidst our suffering by knowing the big picture, the big purpose, and the big promise associated with our suffering. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Kenny begins. I want to speak to you today about, uh, this is a message I gave about three weeks ago at Free Grace Alliance Regional Conference called Suffering Today in View of Tomorrow. And I want to look at it from three aspects, the big picture, the big purpose, and the big promise. The big picture, the big purpose, the big promise. Why do we suffer? Now, the truth is everybody suffers, believer and unbeliever alike. But as believers, we can understand the picture, the purpose, and the promise that goes with suffering. And that's what I want us to spend a little time on this morning from God's Word. So let's open with prayer. Father, thank you so much for your Word. Thank you that we have the privilege of being called your children. And as your children, we have the privilege of walking with our Savior and experiencing some of the same suffering that He did, although not in any way the degree that He did. Thank you for that privilege, Lord, and help us to get a biblical foundation and understanding this morning that we might think correctly when suffering comes into our lives. We just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's spend a little bit of time on the big picture. Now, if you don't have the big picture right as the foundation stone for suffering, then everything else is going to be messed up. So I like to draw this arc, which I think I'm trying to represent time from the beginning of time, and time goes on into eternity. But the idea is that God is over time. He's from eternity past to eternity future. He's sovereign. That simply means he has the right to rule. He doesn't bow the knee to anyone. He's omniscient, which simply means he's all-knowing. He knows everything. And remember now, there's a difference between omniscience and determinism. Just because God knows something is going to happen does not mean that he necessarily determines what's going to happen. Because quite frankly, in his omniscience, he even knows what would have happened if what did happen didn't happen. Go go lay out on a starry night, look at the skies, and mull over that one a little bit. In other words, God knows all possibilities. He's he's amazing in his knowledge, his omniscience. He's also um, what we call omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. He can do what he wants to. Now, he can't do anything. He can't sin. He can't do anything against his nature. But he's all powerful in what he wants to do. Now, if we stopped there with his sovereignty, his omniscience, and his omnipotent, uh, and we knew nothing else about God, we, we would truly be in a little bit of a fearful place because an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-sovereign being, how will he deal with us? But thankfully, we do know more about him. He's not only all of these things. He's what we call omnisapient, and that's just a fancy way to say he's all-wise. His wisdom is all-encompassing. Read the book of Proverbs and all that that wisdom literature talking about how God has put everything into effect and in His wisdom He created. But there are also other things about Him. We, We know He's eternal. We know His attributes of love and grace and mercy and He's holy. All of these characteristics of God must be the big picture that we have when we begin to sort through what happens in time. So we know that there was a creation God created. We know there was a, the fall of men. Adam ate of the fruit. Man fell, sin entered the universe. And even though God in his omniscience knew that, he did not make that happen. Adam and Eve had a real choice in the matter. Satan had a real choice in the matter before that when he rebelled. <clears throat> and then we come into play. We, we, 
we go through the first 12 chapters of Genesis, about 2,000 years of history, and God calls Abraham. He starts a specific nation whom he promises he's going to bring the Messiah through, the chosen one, and then we see Jesus comes on the scene. He's rejected by his people. He dies. He, raises, he's, he rises from the dead. He ascends to heaven, and we're now in this age that we call the church age, which will eventually usher into the event the next prophetic event in history, which will be the rapture of the church, when the church will be taken out of the picture, and then we'll enter back into the time of Israel, the 70th week of Daniel 9, the tribulation. And if I'm saying a bunch, I'm, I'm just, this is not the point of the sermon today. I'm just trying to give this timeline. Out of the tribulation period, we go into what we know as the kingdom period, the millennial kingdom from the millennial kingdom, there's a final rebellion. We have the great white throne. Satan's cast in the lake of fire. The new heavens and new earth are brought forth, and we go into the eternal state. Now, with God, we have to remember that we are in that time of the preparation for the kingdom and eternal state. We're living at that time between the fall of man and the kingdom of God. Now, as the church, we will go into the kingdom with resurrected bodies, with two to rule and reign with him if we are count ourselves worthy. And so what we need to remember is God sees creation just as clearly as he sees the eternal state. He's beyond time. So nothing surprises him. And why is that important with suffering? Well, sometimes when we suffer, we want to say, why God, why me? No, nothing has escaped his sovereignty, his omniscience, his power. And that's where we have to start. We have to have the big picture of who our God is. But we must remember that we're living in between times of ruin and restoration. That's where we live. We're in between times of ruin. We're, we live in a fallen world and the time when things are going to be restored in the kingdom and eventually the eternal state. So, never forget that God is in control. When trials, when testings come along, he hasn't forgotten you. It's, it didn't slip up on him. It, you know, you didn't have this bad thing happen in your life, and God says, oh, oops, I'm, I'm sorry that happened. He, he knew about it. There's nothing he's unaware of or anything that controls or constrains him. You have to start with the big picture of who God is. But beyond that, and here's what's so cool, is that his power is personal. He's, God is too kind to be cruel and too wise to ever make a bad decision. God is too kind to be cruel, and he's too wise to ever make a bad decision. What did, what did Jesus say? What, what father is going to give his son a rock or a snake instead of something good? And the father loves us with an everlasting love. He's too kind to be cruel. He's not going to do bad things to us just because he wants to see us suffer. But he's also too wise to make a mistake. There is a reason for suffering in our lives. That brings us to the big purpose. Dr. Fred Chan, in his book, Suffering Successfully, which is a great little book if you haven't read it, he says, it's said that a person can endure most anything if they know the purpose behind it. Now, how many of you ladies here have ever had a child? I know, don't lie, I know there's, we wouldn't be here if that were not the case, right? Now, I'm thankful that I've never had that experience, but I, I hear that that's not the most pleasant thing in the world. So why, why do you have a baby if it's such a sorrowful, suffering time of labor? Well, you suffer today because you know something coming tomorrow that is going to be greater. Isn't it interesting that Jesus uses that very illustration to his disciples in John chapter 16. He says, truly, truly, this is John 16, 20 and 21. Truly, truly, I say to you that when you will weep and lament and the world will rejoice, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more for joy that a child has been born into the world. You see, we, we suffer today in, in view of 
what's coming tomorrow, even in the physical realm. Unfortunately, we do not always know what is happening, let alone why it's happening. Now, I can suffer something if I know I see the, the outcome, right? Now, I, don't, I know a few of you have had knee, knee replacements and hip replacements and elbow replacements and anything that can be replaced, and that's no fun. It hurts. The rehab I hear is really bad, but you do it because you think the outcome is going to bring you better quality of life, right? But sometimes in, in the Christian life, something happens to us, and we don't know why. We don't know the outcome. Those are the ones that are hard. That's when we have to go back to the big picture and understand the God that we love is too kind to be cruel and too wise to do anything that will be harmful to us. Now, I want to talk a little bit from the scripture on this idea of the purpose. If you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, this is actually not our text, but it parallels our text in James 1. And I just want to read through this just so long we can see the similarities. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1, here we go. <coughs> we'll start in uh, verse 3, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now notice here in verse 3, we're born again. We, we are now believers. We are justified. We have the new birth. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled. It will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. All right, so there's something that's coming. The, the, salvation is not just getting your ticket to heaven. It's realizing that something great is coming, an inheritance. It's reserved for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So remember salvation is in three phases in the Bible. There's salvation from the penalty of sin. We call that justification. There's salvation from the power of sin. We call that sanctification. And eventually we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. We call that glorification. And so there's a time coming when that's going to be revealed in the last time. And in this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Why are we distressed by various trials? That the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's something coming tomorrow that has to do with how we live today. When we suffer trials today and we do it correctly, then there's going to be praise, glory, and honor when Christ comes. And though you've not seen him, verse 8, you love him. And though you don't see him now, you believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Now, don't misunderstand that verse. It's not saying that if I live a certain life, I get to go to heaven. We already know from verse 3 we're already born again. It's saying the deliverance of your suke, your life, is the outcome of living the proper life today. It's the same thing as Matthew 16. He who wishes to save his life today loses it in the sense of he loses the reward that God has promised. But the one who loses his life today, not necessarily dying physically, but loses his affection for this world, has an eternal gain in the world to come. So this is the backdrop. This is a parallel. Now, if you just back up two or three pages in your Bible to James chapter 1, let's look at what James has to say about this. Now, the book of James teaches us that testing produces true Christian character. Two ways, by producing endurance, which we need, and by helping us become mature. <clears throat> now, look at James 
1, verses 2 and 3. Consider it all joy, my brethren, talking to us believers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, why can't we just have endurance? Why does it have to be tested? Well, if you don't test your faith, you don't know what sort of quality it's going to be. Now, a few of you here are in Grace School of Theology. I know David, Sam, a number of you. Now, when you get to the end of your course, the professor says, you know what, I'm just going to give everybody an A. Is that what happens? No. What do you normally have to do? You have to take a final over the whole course. You're tested. You, you have to find out if you endured the course and you learned the material, do you not? Well, that's true of anything. The same is true of the Christian walk. Remember, we're living in the time between the ruin and the restoration, and God is building our character in this life to prove what we can do for him in the coming kingdom. So we ought to consider it joy when we encounter various trials. Now, is that easy to do? No. Do I always do it? No. But that should be my mindset, knowing that testing of our faith produces endurance. Now, when he says consider that, that's a command. He's not saying, well, you know, you ought to consider. No, he said count it joy. Consider it all joy. And the reason is that only trials can produce endurance. I like this quote. The only way to know and show you're maturing is to go through a time of testing. That's the only way to know. The only way to know that you are proven is to go through a time of proving. Pain is truly the gift nobody wants, but everybody needs. Everybody want pain? I don't. But we need it at times to help us learn to grow and, and get our needed endurance. And then the second thing he says in James 1.4 is, let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Notice those three terms. The result of endurance is to be made perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. I call these the steps to maturity. You want to know if you're mature in your Christian faith? Well, have you become mature because of trials and things that come into your life? Are you complete? This word tends to mean whole or blameless. And the blameless kind of carries a moral connotation of blameless in our character and our walk with God. Lacking in nothing, meaning not falling short, to be, to be fully ready. So if, if we see those things in our life, then the trial, the, the sorrow has produced the work of endurance that it should. Remember this, trials come into our life to make us better, not bitter. If you're bitter because of bad things that happen to you, you're not enduring the way that James tells us to do. You're not counting it joy. Uh, Paul says the same thing in, in Thess 1 Thessalonians 5, you know. Rejoice always. In everything give thanks. You know, this is God's will for you. In everything. Did I vote for cancer? No. But I'm thankful. I'm joyful. Because that's in God's omniscient plan. I know my father's not cruel and I know he's wise. And so I realize that these things come into our life to make us better, not bitter. I really like this quote. I think this comes from Dr. Che's book. We live life looking forward. We understand life looking backward. Faith means believing in advance, which only makes sense in reverse. Now, I would add one caveat to that. I would say we live life looking forward. We understand life looking backward sometimes. We don't always understand life looking backwards. It may not be until we stand before the Lord and he shows us the reason that we understand it fully. But a lot of times, we, you know, what do we say? Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? <laughs> Going forward, should I buy this house or should I buy that car? And then, and then looking back and say, I wish I hadn't bought that house or that car. Yeah, but, but hindsight's twenty twenty. That's why we pray and we ask God to guide us. But we live life looking forward. We understand it looking back. So faith then means that we believe in advance, which we may not understand until we put it in reverse and look backwards. So what about when God is silent? 
Now, we read from, from uh, John 16, you know that child's coming in, in a few hours, hopefully, short labor, and we've got something to look for. But, but what about when the trial is happening and it goes on and on and on and God is silent? We don't get an answer. Well, again, we have to go back to the big picture of who God is. But I like this. Instead of asking, why, Lord? And that's what we tend to do. Like, why me, Lord? Instead of why, Lord, ask, Lord, for what great purpose have you allowed this difficulty into my life? For what great purpose have you allowed this difficulty into my life? I heard somebody say it this way. Your mess often becomes your ministry. Your mess, whatever you're going through, whether it's good or bad or whether you caused it or whatever, often becomes your ministry. Now, I, I tell people, if you're having marital troubles, do you want to go to a young seminary student that's single, or do you want to go to a, a wise couple that's been married for 40 years and they've been through the battles? I would opt for the last one. Your mess becomes your ministry. What, not why me, Lord, but Lord, what great purpose do you have for this difficulty in my life? And then in 112, we'll skip down. This becomes the big promise, the big picture. God's in control. He's sovereign. He's wise. He knows what's going on. He's, he's too wise to be cruel. He, he loves us personally. Uh, the, the, the big purpose is that we learn endurance. We learn Christian character. We grow to maturity. But there's a promise that comes with suffering. Verse 12, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved, he will, be, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, there's a reason for trials. When you endure, when that day comes, the day of Christ, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, God promises reward for those who have faithfully walked with him through their trials. Now understand, there's a difference between eternal security and eternal significance. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are eternally secure, whether you know it or not, because it depends on God's promise and His power. Jesus said, He who believes in me has everlasting life. That's His promise. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in Him <coughs> should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's promise. He doesn't go back on his promise. But there's a difference between being born again and knowing you're going to heaven and being eternally significant. That's the whole area of being able to lay down before Jesus your crowns, being able to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Eternal significance depends upon what we do right now. In other words, right now counts forever. Some people are, you know, they, they, they criti criticize those of us who believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. They say, well, if you teach people that, they'll just go out and live as they please. They won't serve the Lord. I found actually the opposite to be true. I found out when people understand the grace of God, they're motivated more to serve Him. And when they understand what God promises, I didn't come up with the idea of rewards. That's all through Scripture. That's God's thing. And rewards are not a carrot out before, you know, you do this, God's going to give you the carrot. Rewards have to do with the motive of your heart and wanting to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. And when you follow the motives of your heart and you do it the right way, God promises eternal significance. At the earliest, it's ruling and reigning him with, during the millennial kingdom. I don't know what that means. You know, he, he gives the story of the servants, and one of them gets to rule over ten cities and one five cities. And so I, I'm assuming we're going to be his ambassadors in the kingdom, in resurrection bodies, doing what he wants us to do because we were faithful now. Right now counts forever. Dr. Chase says it this way, The right to rule the world of the future is for those who have endured and suffered for Christ and have triumphed and overcome the temptations, tests, and trials of this world. 
goes on to say, suffering is the gift no one wants, but everybody needs. If they wish to develop spiritual muscle and display the spiritual maturity that is worthy of reigning with Christ. Why should we count it joy when we suffer? Because it's preparing us for the world to come. We suffer today in view of tomorrow. Now, I like, I want to close with a verse from Romans 18. This is a parallel verse, one of my favorite verses. Uh, it basically wraps up what I've been saying into just a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> Romans 8, 17, it says, We are children of God, and if children, and, and that could almost be translated since, that's a first class, meaning it's assumed to be true. If children, we are heirs also, heirs of God. So if you've believed in Jesus Christ, you are an heir of God. You are going to be with him in heaven if you die, or we'll be with him in heaven if we're raptured. We will be with him in the millennial kingdom as a servant king. But it goes on and says you are fellow heirs or joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. You see, there's a, there's a stipulation here. Any child of God is going to be with him because of faith alone and Christ alone. That's the good news of the gospel. There are no strings attached. But if you want to suffer with him and rule and reign and be glorified with him, then that's another category. He goes on to say, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You see, if we could get the mindset of, if, if we can get past the petty stuff of this world and keep an eternal vision, then suffering in this world doesn't become a burden so much. It is a joy that we get to suffer with our Savior. Instead of asking, why me, Lord, what, look, for what reason, Lord, have you allowed this to come into my life? How are you going to use this in my life? Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we don't lose heart. This is 4, 16 through 18. But though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And again, I don't know what that's going to look like, but what Paul says, it's far beyond anything we can compare it to. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. When you're suffering in life today, and we, and we all suffer in various means and ways, different things, different circumstances, we have to get step back from the right now moment temporally and say, okay, Lord, I know you have a purpose for this. And if I endure it properly, if I endure it with joy, don't, that means I have to be happy, but I can be joyful, then the day is going to come when I will understand and the glory that you will give in that situation is far beyond anything I can imagine or compare to. You know, Psalm 30 says, sorrow may last for not the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Maybe we're walking through the night right now. Maybe you're walking through the night in your life. Always have that hope, knowing who your God is, knowing the big picture, knowing the purpose of suffering and the promise that he has to come and you will be successful. Let's just take three practical truths from this. First of all, God is sovereign and God is good. Never lose sight of that. God doesn't make mistakes. He's not mean. He's not out to get us. He's out. He brings suffering and discipline in our life, sometimes because of sin in our lives. The wages of sin is, is death. I mean, sometimes God disciplines us as his children, but it's always to bring us back closer to him. It's never in a punitive sort of way as his children. And so he does what he needs to to bring us back in our walk with him. Secondly, God allows his people to suffer for a greater good. That's the whole point. Suffering is for a greater good. 
It's not pleasant. It's not necessarily something that makes us happy. But if we have the right perspective, we can understand why. And thirdly, God desires that we would serve one another as we suffer together. Your mess becomes your ministry. When we suffer, you know, Galatians 6 says, if you see a brother overcome in something, humbly lift him up. We're to serve one another. When we see one another suffering, we're to come to, come to our aid. We're to encourage. But the biggest encouragement when somebody is suffering is to say, don't give up. Hang in there. Understand God has a purpose for this. And if you endure it properly, you will have great reward and great glory. Now, I've been talking to believers <clears throat> Uh, if, if you're here and you don't know you have eternal life, that's really, really simple. You see, faith is simple. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're placed into the family of God. That's what that big blue circle represents. And that's simple. It's by grace alone through faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. John three sixteen, John six forty seven. he who believes in me has eternal life. So salvation is truly a gift because it's paid for by God. He did the finished work on the cross for our eternal salvation. So faith is simple and family is secure. Once you're in the family of God, you're there eternally. Because you didn't do anything to get in, you can't do anything to get out. God is the one who holds you in his hand. But we don't just want to be in the family. We don't want to just be know that we have eternal, uh, eternal life. We want to have eternal significance. And that's what I call the joy of fellowship. When you walk with the Lord in fellowship, then the Holy Spirit's going to give you the ability to endure trials and suffering and walk with Him. And then ultimately, our goal is to hear, when we stand before the Lord, to hear Him say, well, hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link www dot cbc woodlands dot org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.